um, the talk that we have today. This is his wide-ranging work on the frontiers of tactical media and art activism. He has been working with electronic and new media since 1983, and his work um, in online gaming performance, sculpture, electro-mechanical installation, um, and other variety of other forms have been shown extensively throughout the world. Often creating edgy compositions across a variety of media, his work frequently makes creative interventions into such contemporary issues as drone warfare, gun violence, and the digital domain. Um, in 2015, he collaborated with a Biome Collection to develop the computer game Killbox, a two-person shooter which explores the complexities and consequences of drone warfare. This project was nominated as Best Computer Game for a Scottish BAFTA Award in 2016. And in 2017, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, and he has developed works for venues such as iBeam in New York, the Guangdong Museum of Art in China, Transitio MX in Mexico City, and the ICC Intercommunication Center in Tokyo, among many, many others. Originally from the hometown here, San Francisco, he is currently professor of games and tactical media at Aberdeen University in Dundee, Scotland, where he relocated in 2016 after directing the digital media studio at the University of Nevada, Reno, which he founded in 1993. And although I have long admired his work, um, we only met recently, just in the past year, when I was fortunate enough to be able to curate some of the work that I think you'll see tonight into it in an exhibition. So I am now excited to introduce him to you. Please join me in welcoming Joseph Delatter. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, very much for that um, very kind introduction. Um, it would be nice if we could get the lights on a little bit. It seems like they went back up when you were doing the intro, but they don't know how. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I, I'm really happy to be speaking in my hometown. Um, nice to be back. Uh, I Just a bit of background on um, how I came to be where I am. Uh, born and raised here, you know, got out of, went to a Sacred Heart High School, Catholic High School, which at the time was all boys, um, not too far from here, over by the cathedral. and. Um, they had no art classes at all. Like there was zero art classes. There was one art class you could take your final term in your senior year that was at the girls' school across the street. And I took that class and it was the really the only class in all of high school where I got an A and I was the best student in the class. And at the end of the term, um, I was actually, I wasn't planning on going to college, university, anything. I was actually planning on going to a band just to go with my room to form a roommate who was here. Um, and it was really, you know, it was, it was seeing someone being creative and basically doing it, very much a DIY scene, you know, pick up a bass, a guitar, start a band, um, and, you know, stick it to the band. And it was, you know, the Reagan era, all of that, and it was very much, you know, uh, I, I was in the design program, graphic design at the time, and very quickly realized that graphic design programs are generally all about advertising, and, and I just could not stomach the possibility of going into a career of essentially selling things the rest of my life. And I was at the same time being exposed to all of these elective courses in photography and a new program that started in 1983 or 80, yeah, 83 at San Jose State uh, called Computers in Art and Design. And one of my design professors said, everything's going digital, you need to take this class, you know, if you're, if you're going into this field. And I was like, oh, I hate fucking and I went and took the class, kind of on a whim, and it was nothing like I expected. They had brought in a, a guy from uh, MIT's Visible Language Workshop, Joel Slayton, who started this program. And it was this conceptual, like crazy, wonderful um, thing where by the end of the term, this group of about 20 students, myself, and we had computer science students, art students, design students, we transformed the classroom into essentially a big interactive installation. We all did little pieces that were, and it was kind of created this warren of things. And the word interactivity really wasn't even used. You know, it was like we were inventing the ways to do this. One guy made a, took a uh, construction helmet 
and we were working with, uh, we had one Apple II computer and three Commodore 64s amongst 20 students, and we shared and did all these things. This one guy did a, he turned his head into a joystick with, a, with little sensors on it, and it was just this visual where you turned your head and it went like that, and it went like that. It was amazing, right? This is stuff that hadn't been done. Um, I actually did, uh, the first project I ever did was a uh, adaptation of Joseph Weizenbaum's Eliza. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, it, was a, uh, uh, it was an example of why AI is something to be questioned made in the 1960s by this computer scientist at MIT, and it was a, 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 it was a psychotherapist in a computer. And he made it uh, to show why we shouldn't do these things, like why natural language processing is questionable, and et cetera, et cetera. But people loved it. Like the, he, he had, the secretary shut the door on him and was actually getting very intimate with this machine, and it horrified him. But anyway, that's a different story. But I made the first piece I made was an interactive Catholic confessional. So you knelt down at the computer, went through your sins, and the computer gave you your sins. And anyway, come a long way since then. But so. I eventually went out of the design program, went into the master's program at San Jose State, and, and um, had not stopped making kind of work related to art, technology, society, politics, etc. So I've got a lot of slides here. I, I know I'm supposed to have like an hour, so we'll see how we do. Um, if you have any questions on the way, please please jump in. I'm, I'm going to go through a lot of stuff here, probably fairly quickly. Um, just some some. Earlier stuff, this is uh, from the late 90s, and uh, this is an actual sculpture. Uh, it's called the Heart Mouse, and um, this was the first mouse sculpture, mouse piece that I did. And part of this was as a result of running computer labs. I was running the computer lab at uh, University of Nevada and, and Reno, the digital media program, and any of you working at that time, you, the mice would die, right? They, they would stop working. They had this little ball and they, they'd get gummed up and the equipment actually would die. And when you have, I think we had about six computers with about 30 students. They just, you know, we were going through all this equipment and I would say, I started saving it and I was like, this you know, horrible to throw it away. So I made this into a Valentine. Um, uh, these model building skills from being a, a nerdy teenager. Um, and. Actually, I gifted it to my former roommate, who is here for his wedding present, because he met his wife on the internet and it was totally appropriate. So. Um, but the uh, the next piece was probably a little more hardcore. Um, but this is the vagina mouse, and this was a response in part to this joystick. That was actually the joystick I had started playing some games like uh, Tie Fighter and that sort of thing. Uh, mostly seeing that my students were playing these things and getting kind of curious, but also thinking, you know, looking at it, and it's so obviously a male designed object and phallic beyond belief. And I thought it needs this kind of hit heteronormative partner. Uh, so I made a vagina mouse and uh, they, they kind of coexist together. Um, I did a number of projects engaging with discarded, used, obsolete technology. A lot of this from Having been in San Jose, San Jose State, and there was this used to be this amazing um, store called Weird Stuff Warehouse. I think it was in Cupertino, as I recall. And it was like the size of a Home Depot, and it was the discards from the industry. So these were, you know, um, game controllers. Um, it was all uh, Microsoft mice, and, and you know the mouse balls, the track balls inside the mice, uh, and just started making these these useless kind of sculptures out of these now useless bits of technology. Um, the largest one uh, is the mouse mandala, and this was, I, I don't even know how many mice, but it's actually woven together into a growing mandala, which um, had several ideas behind it, one being thinking about, um, well, all of these mice pretty much came from Silicon Valley cubicle work culture. Right? And I started thinking about that as the, the akin to the Industrial Revolution in Britain and the, the weavers who were thrown out of work and put into factories to, to do the automated you know, machine-based weaving and the Luddites who were burning and you know, blowing up factories and that sort of thing. And it just sort of tied in, in a way. And, and I love the fact that all of these mice traveled thousands of miles on somebody's desktop and they were dirty and you know, used and 
it, in some ways it's a memorial, um, in other ways it kind of references a kind of faux sort of religiosity around technology that I think we all sort of inhabit at this point. Um, the, the, the one mouse piece that I made that was actually functional was this one. Uh, this is my artist mouse, the original artist mouse. I ended up making, uh, I think I've got about five or six versions of this. And this was um, inspired by a number of things, but it was really kind of thinking about what is a mouse, right? What does it do? And it kind of, it kind of draws, it kind of points, it kind of, and it sort of latched onto the drawing bit. And so basically this device allowed me to translate my computer time into marks on paper. Um, and I was, at the time, I had just started, again, further playing, engaging in these games that I had seen my students playing. Um, it segued into this kind of obsessive play, um, which would make interesting marks, right? So I was playing this game, which is playing, uh, this is un the original Unreal, um, in this about 1998. So I played levels of the game and replaced my mouse pad with uh, fine art rag paper so that it became this kind of literal mapping of the gameplay that created these really kind of curious and interesting abstract drawings. Um, I went on to make loads of drawings, uh, recording for a while all of my computer time uh, into these drawings. And again, it's like you could reverse map backwards and see all of my clicks on you know, writing papers for conferences, surfing the internet, playing games, you know, answering emails. Um, it was quite revelatory, you know, just sort of see that translated into physical form and, and that, that limited little bit of space that the mouse inhabits on the desktop, you know, but traveling miles and miles. Um, the, one on, the ones on the bottom uh, right, those were, each of those were, were, were just about a month of all of my computer time. This one I did when I was um, chair of my art department and really wasn't making much art, but I decided to set it up at my desk as chair. So I would actually still be making something. Um, I did a few variations on this. Um, this one was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty pivotal, actually, um, in retrospect. I actually, this was in like August of 2000, 2001. Um, I thought, okay, I was thinking about this kind of obsessive, repetitive marking of the mouse, and started thinking about, you know, like, uh, 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 Bart Simpson rewriting on the chalkboard, the sort of punishment kind of thing, right? That you're doing this again and again. So I actually literally made these square slates of uh, chalkboard with chalkboard paint and wood. And, and I was going to do this for several months, and I, and I date stamp each one, and would do a day of all my computer time. And the piece was called Lessons Lesson Learned. Like it was this. But the odd thing was that I, I just, I had made all of this stuff, got all set up to do this, and 9-11 happened. And, and it was, I think the first one, I don't know if it's on this, these slides, but I showed this recently in Oklahoma and realized that the first one I did was like September 12th. And this piece became about something really different um, because of that. And it, 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 there's a darkness to it that was not even really intended. But originally, the idea was to do, I did these two squares that you were know, like the footprints of the tower, the towers in a way. Um, but oddly, I stopped. I stopped doing it. And I think it was, you know, this is like, I don't know, 60 days or something after 9-11. And I think I was so depressed and so like upset to see where things were going foreboding, you know, the, the Bush administration and the rallying towards the disaster we've now are all familiar with. So I stopped doing it. I never finished it. Um, but this was very pivotal in, in this kind of shift towards memorialization and politics in the work. Um, in the meantime, I was doing other works uh, engaging in gameplay. Uh, first performance I ever did in a game space was this one, which is called Howl Elite Force Voyager. And uh, I was playing the shooter games, and they were, uh, not, a couple years before here, they started going online, where you could actually play against other players across the internet. And then there was this weird sort of communication 
via texting in the game that was really interesting and very strange to me. And I started to think about that as this stranger in this virtual 3D space able to run around and kill each other. But the only way you could communicate is with the 19th century invention of the keyboard, right? You had to stop and type. But I like that. It was like this analog process to get through this digital system. I thought, why not use that for some performative aspects? So what I did was essentially, um, I went into the game as Allen Ginsberg, and rather than play the game, I would stand still, and I typed, recited Howell word for word. It's a, it's a book-sized, book-length poem. I did the entire poem in about a three-hour period. And I was getting slaughtered, and I was getting killed the whole time, and other players were like, oh, cool, poetry and killing, wow. You know? <laughs> and, and it was just, I didn't know, it was just this experiment. I had no idea whether it was interesting, I thought it was kind of stupid, um, but there was something there that just kept coming back into the work. Um, I, a couple years later, I had this idea about expanding the performance. I invited five of my gaming, game playing digital media students to form a temporary performance group. And we went into a Quake Arena server, each of us in character is one of the um, actors from the TV show Friends. And we performed an entire episode in Quake. So it's called Quake Friends. And we eventually did uh, a full performance of it. In, a, in the gallery at the university where we were each sitting at a computer typing the dialogue from this episode of Friends and, and saying it at that same time and while wow, we're getting just completely slaughtered by all the other players because we're not shooting. Um, interesting aspect of this work was um, uh, it got written about in the New York Times like a week before it was to happen. Internet uh, arts writer Matt Miracle picked up on it and wrote a wonderful story in the New York Times. And I was just like totally excited about this. Next day, I get contacted by attorneys from Warner Brothers Television. And they say, You're not to use Quake material, you remove our, our, our friends' material, you remove it all from your website, da, 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 threaten you with a lawsuit, etc. And I went to the uh, University Council at UNR and asked for their advice. And of course, they panicked. They're like, Do everything they say. You know, and I was like, and I knew something about fair use, and, and so I, I pushed back and, and actually went ahead with the performance. And um, but it was really interesting to get that kind of kind of viral um, attention for a work. It's, it's, it's very seductive and also very gratifying as an artist to know that thousands of people read about this, you know, know about the work, but also you know the sense that probably the cast members from the TV show create a digitally networked series of kinetic dioramas depicting scenes from the war and these four cameras had a random switchers that would move between the cameras and it was going to go online 24-7 and just be called War Movie um, and you could watch this as it went. Um, didn't finish this because I had a flood of my studio which um, wiped out that project, all my slides, all kinds of the drawings that I showed you in the previous um, slides. This was a devastating experience, um, and actually, I mean, in retrospect, this is one of those first kind of kind of global warming events. It was a it was a hot pineapple express storm that came through and melted all the snow in the Sierras and, and inundated Reno with water. Um, this, you know, the, the hundred year flood, which now happens every ten years or so. Um, so, I had to shift gears, and I had this idea for a piece um, related to this game. Um, America's Army was a, a very popular um, recruiting platform developed by the, the U.S. military, uh, launched July 4th, 2002, and uh, one of the 10, 10 most downloadable games in the world um, with, with millions of registered users, etc. Um, I remember when this game came out, and I was like, wow, this is a serious game, uh, something, there, there's something that needs to be done with this. Um, so, uh, I had had this idea, but I was working on that war movie piece, and then when that war movie piece went away, and because we were away from home at the time, that flood happened, all I had was my laptop. So, so I came back and cleaned up from the flood, and then in March of that year, two, uh, three months after the flood, 
I started this intervention into the America's Army game. Uh, the work was called Dead in Iraq, and um, essentially what I would do is go into the game, and uh, instead of playing the game, I would type in my, my avatar's name, and I would type in the name, age, service branch, and date of death of each American soldier who, who had died in, in the war. Um, there's a video here. here. So you go into the game, you're part of a... a die once and then you wait until the next round and I would usually lie, lie in state and you'll see me typing. On 26 Army, January 12, 2008. This is just some sequences from, from the game, some recordings. As, as you can imagine, this was not a popular thing to do. Um, the other players would generally, you know, start to react. RIP, this is the game. Um, you know, please don't do this here. You know that type of thing. And I did not break character. I just would keep typing. Um, but they, you know, they would. It, it told me they were paying attention, right? And so this is like someone says, "Dead, please. This is not the forum to do this." Someone else says, "I don't give a fuck." Uh, Man, with all the hackers, go play ping pong or something. Um, and ultimately, if I was kicked out of the match, that means that all. Like there were eight players, including myself, in this game. All seven, besides myself, voted to kick me out. I was like, "Yay!" You know, right? They, they all, they were all conscious of what I was doing, and I could. My sense was that they would be thinking about this afterwards, right? And thinking about the fact that something was breaking what they call in gaming the magic circle, right? And I was basically saying, "No, this is not neutral." game space. This is a military funded, this is part of the war, right? It's a virtual, it's virtually connected to the Pentagon and what's going on in Iraq is just no one actually dies, right? And you get to go play being a soldier. It's, it's, it's kind of disgusting on a basic level, uh, considering what was happening on the other side of the world. Um, so yeah, so I did this. It was very controversial. I've uh, got some really intense press and some interviews, NPR, um, all kinds of news stories in Wired Magazine, that sort of thing. And I would I then would be reading the comments, and the commentators were generally really like, someone should go break this guy's legs, and da 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 And, and I, I started engaging in those conversations in the comment sections. I would say, I'm the, I'm the person doing this, and here's why. And trying to get into some kind of dialogue, and at least come to a, a reasonable point at that you know, we could agree to disagree. Um, but you know this is, this is a way to both memorialize in a contemporary digital context, context and also protest at the same time, right, to call attention to this game that is so uh, such a fake experience that is actually directly connected to the conflict. Um, there are other aspects of the American Army Project. It's quite a huge undertaking. The game is no longer online, by the way. Um, I think it was taken off last year, as I recall. But they had a, they had America's Army action figures. These are real heroes. People who actually came back from the war in one piece. Um, I actually decided to make one of my own action figures based on that screenshot that I showed you previous of where mine was, uh, was dead and um, would show this. And a curious thing happened. You know, I was doing one of these presentations some years ago and I was looking for this image on the left, you know, a picture of the, of the actual action figure. And I typed in America's Army action figure in Google search, and this was the result, which really kind of blew me away, because it's like, that's, that's the figure before I painted it. There's my work, uh, there's my work, there's my work, right? And I was like, oh, this is like an accidental intervention, right? So someone's been looking for America's Army action figure, they're going to be like, what is this? And then they'll click on it, and they'll be like, you know, I, I like that. that carried into some other works that you'll see in a minute here. Um, one of the things that happened in doing the America's Army Project, in one of these ex 
exchanges I was having with a detractor. Um, this guy said, dude, you got a Gandhi complex. And I was like, wow, like you think being like Gandhi is a negative, you know? And, and so I embraced that. I was, and I had been thinking about doing a walking piece in a game space for some time. So th these are images of, of Mahatma Gandhi and his famous uh, salt march in uh, 1930, where he went, walked 240 miles and collected salt at the beach at Dandi, which was an illegal act because government control of all the resources in India. So what I did, I said, do you want, do you say I'm like Gandhi? I'll become Gandhi. Um, I made a, a Gandhi avatar in Second Life and then walked using a Nordic track, walk fit treadmill converted into a game control. And I walked 240 miles over um, 26 days interacting, and, and, and Second Life at the time had a contiguous space equivalent of the size of Singapore, the nation of Singapore. Um, so I walked, and I interacted with other residents, and it was more so an exploration like, of, of many things, including the rhetoric surrounding this early version of the metaverse. You, you could be anything, you could be anybody. So I said, okay, why not go and what would it be like to be this historical figure in this very sort of fantasy game space? Um, it was an extremely physical undertaking. That's not an electric treadmill. You, it's, it's actually um, it's analog. You have to push. Um, it was uh, the most immersive thing I think I've done to date. Um, I would be staring at my avatar walking for about six to eight hours a day. And when I left I-beam, New York where I was doing this and walk down the streets of New York City and think I could clip on people. You know, it's like I be in the subway and it's like all of a sudden my brain is back in second life. And it was very it was really intense, um, and very transformative in, in a profound way. I also lost eight pounds and it's probably the best shape of my life. Um, and it was fun. Um, it was crazy fun. And which was a real salve to dead in Iraq, which it was doing at the same time, right? And being constantly attacked. And it was just wonderful to be going places in Second Life and these other avatars would be like, Gandhi, what's up? What are you doing here? You know, and I'd explain to him what I was doing. And I was on a treadmill and landed having loads of followers and people. And I would give them gifts of my walking stick, by the way, and they would join me to walk. Um, at the end of this, I was on this wonderful commissioned residency at IBM in New York City and Chelsea in their old space. And they had this huge warehouse space and I was one of two commissioned residents and we had a show at the end of the six months in this enormous space. And I was like, wow, I wanna do something that basically documents the enormity of this experience. And so I started exploring how to translate my Gandhi avatar, which is here extracted from Second Life. Um, and started working with Papercraft. Uh, this is through Pepecura Designer which usually makes small desktop paper craft models. I, I, I adapted it for large-scale production in cardboard. I um, spent six weeks building this pretty much by myself um, and made him the same height as Michelangelo's David, which I believe was uh, 14 feet, if I'm correct. And he's slipping here a little bit. But uh, and showed it with artifacts on the treadmill and videos and that kind of thing. Um, I was from this object and, and performance, I was invited to create a second Gandhi in Guangzhou, China, which I went and I did. And this was extraordinary, not just going to China, but that they, we had two weeks to do this. And I said, well, I need a crew. And so they gave me a crew of workers and volunteers, and, and that was a revelation. I pretty much always worked by myself, but this working with others was magical, like it became, a collaborative experience, and the, and the other people working on it became their work as much as mine. Um, it was very special. Uh, I got invited also to build the third one that was in uh, Mechelen, Belgium, at a, um, a, a show. And this one was actually transported to uh, Belfast, Ireland for Isaiah in 2009 and was shown there. And a wonderful thing about this little, little, bit, little story from that, um, I wasn't going to be there when the piece was going to be taken apart. And it had been up for about seven months in Belgium and transported, and it wasn't in great shape, but I put it back in good shape in Belfast. But I said, you know, 
the end of the show, he needs to be recycled. But could you promise me that none of the cardboard gets goes into a the dump, that it's all recycled? And, and one of the workers said, oh, I'm involved in uh, guerrilla gardening projects in Belfast. We'll, we'll put them in our compost. And we'll be growing flowers along mediums in Belfast, <laughs> which was like fantastic, right? Um, I also uh, shared this online on instructables.com. Uh, if you don't know Instructables, it's a maker site, right? And you go there, you can learn about doing anything. And I think it was one of the first examples of someone sharing a contemporary uh, art project. Uh, at the time, I mean, it got 55,000 views, you know? And uh, was in the, a book that they did, and, and I, I love finding these alternative sources to kind of share contemporary art. You go to an art gallery, you show something in a gallery, maybe a couple thousand people come through. But you get put something like in here, and it's like getting your work out there in a very different way uh, and sharing. And I know at least two artists who were inspired by this, young people who landed up, there's one guy who has an entire career now making low polygon cardboard um, for a living. It's, it's really great. Um, this is jumping a little bit, but uh, after I did the Gandhi walk, I wanted to do something that was this durational kind of performance with get out of, like when I was on a treadmill, you're in the same place. Well, it wasn't actually moving. I wanted to see if I could take that out into the real world. I had come across this quote that said, if a concentrated solar power system was built that was 100 miles by 100 miles square in size in the American Southwest, this would be more than enough to meet the country's entire energy demand. And I was like, hmm, that, that seems entirely reasonable. And I lived in Nevada at the time, American Southwest, you know, 300 days of sunshine. Um, I started, oops, started looking at the map of Nevada and wondering, like, what does that, what, what does that translate to? And well, this, this bit right here, that's about exactly 100 mile by 100 mile square. That is what was formerly called the, Nevada, uh, the, the Nellis Air Force Range. It's now called the Nellis Test and Training Range. It's the largest peacetime military base in the world. Um, this is where all 928 nuclear tests were done, uh, above and below ground. Uh, it's where Area 51 is, you know, where the aliens are hidden away. It's actually where they tested all of our secret aircraft, including drones, SR-71, etc. Um, yeah, and it, it just, I was like, oh, okay, so that's what we're talking about. If that was a solar farm, a massive solar farm, you know, it would add tremendously to our, our, our dealing with global warming and our energy uh, needs. Um, so I came up with this idea of, could I circumnavigate this space? And not just circumnavigate it, but actually draw a physical line around the entire area as a way of demarcating what that imagined solar power um, uh, uh, place could be. So I, converted a long tail bicycle into a drawing system. It's kind of like the mouse, but with the, the drawing mechanism dragging behind the bike. And I proceeded to ride, I think it was 460 miles total, around the base um, over a 10 day period. Uh, this was intense, uh, very physical. It was always either hot, cold, windy, or shifting one way or the other, very harsh environment, but an amazing experience and also quite revelatory just to kind of see the desert in, in this way. And um, one of the final stops was riding past Creech Air Force Base, which became very significant going forward. Um, Creech, which is uh, within the Nellis Test and Training range is, range, is one of the primary command, patrol, and training basis for America's drone warfare. Um, started reading more about drones and, and, and all that and became uh, really kind of disgusted. And, and this was actually during the uh, Obama administration. He really ramped up the use of drones significantly. Um, I, did a, I did a project, my first drone works, and I basically took the top search engine results for predator drones and reaper drones and rebranded them with a sort of military logo, uh, just cowardly. These are my cowardly drones. Um, did a number of these. And 
then I put them back onto various sites, a Tumblr account, my website, Facebook, etc., to see if I could do that thing that happened with the America's Army action figure. Um, so that if you typed in Predator Drone, could I get these images to show up? And lo and behold, they did. Um, this is some years ago. I don't think they show up at this point. Um, but for a couple of years, uh, they would show up in those searches, which I, I thought was, you know, again, people would click on those, what the hell is this, you know, and, uh, I like that. Um, some other drone works, um, just quickly here. This is actually from a, a video of uh, Afghani villagers stoning a crashed drone. Um, I was commissioned by Fresno State University to uh, do a project, a temporary project, and what I proposed to do was to create a full-size Predator drone, but out of yellow corrugated plastic. Um, we built this with design students and volunteers from the community, installed this as if it had crashed, fallen from the sky, and then we had a performative kind of memorial ceremony. These are um, Afghani immigrants to uh, uh, Fresno who are reading aloud the names of civilian drone casualties from the North Waziristan region, many of whom were children. Like this is Sohail, uh, age seven. And handed the card to volunteers who then went and wrote these names on the surface of the drone as an act of memory. Um, this was really intense. Um, uh, they translated each name uh, into their native tongue as well, and uh, Urdu. And yeah, this was another one of those like taking that experience of collaboratively working on Gandhi and creating this piece together within this community. And there's some of these students contacted me a couple years later and said it was the most significant thing they did when they were in the university. Uh, but this was on display for about three months, and, and it was under the flight path of an Air Force base, by the way, which was quite nice. It actually showed up on Google, uh, Google Earth for a while. Um, another drone piece, uh, this is called Me and My Predator, and I basically made a kind of head piece with a model Predator drone that would follow me around, and I wore this around San Francisco. This was part of a residency I was doing in San Francisco at um, Autodesk, Pier 9 at their digital workshop. Um, and this was kind of a thing like was, like these drones you don't see. Like we don't see them because they're literally on the other side of the globe. So it was like bringing it home. Like here it is and it's following me. And someone would say, hey, there's a drone. I turn around and can't see it, right? You know. Um, another one that I put on Instructables as a personal drone system in my Predator. And what's really great, what I thought about this one, again, you know, 52,000 views, um, the comments are fantastic. You know, how is this a drone? This is very miscategorized. Don't name it personal drone system if you glue it to your hat. It isn't a drone. You don't see a drone? Funny. I don't either. You know, it's like, and then it's like, you know, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, and, it, and it goes, you know, I like that, again, interrupting people's daily lives in our comfort while, you know, there's people on the other side of the globe who are being interrupted by bombs falling on them, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's a, it becomes a kind of a strange simile in a way. Um, another drone piece, um, this was done in Autodesk as well, but I made, I ended up making thousands of uh, drone stamps, and these were to stamp little predator drones on your cache and then go spend it. And I, I put out a call on Facebook, this is it. Hey kids, I've laser, laser up some rubber stamps for an intervention, I'm calling in Drones We Trust. If you want one, I'm willing to stamp in green on the back of your bills, send me a message. And so I sent out about 200 of these in it initially and then it just sort of grew from there. There's a website, a Tumblr site called in Drones We Trust, you can go see hundreds of examples of cash from all over the world and people would go there and spend it. Again, it's like making them visible, bringing them back. Um, again, I put this on Instructables, and the comments, like this is a full-on debate about drone policy, right? In this maker space, you know, I like that. Um, a few other works here. Um, I was always interested in how terrorists were represented in many shooter games and did some further extraction, similar to Gandhi. Um, I ended up making 
These are called my Taliban hands. They're about three and a half foot long each. And it's like, they, they look like marble, but they're actually corrugated white plastic. Um, this is the game that they actually came from, which is Medal of Honor, quite controversial, because you can actually play as a Taliban killing American soldiers. <coughs> Only game uh, banned from US military PMs is um, when it was released. But I sh show you this, because this is typical of, of shooter games, right? There's always this sort of equal pairing on sides in terms of weapons. It's mostly the ability of the players that matters. Um, you know, I've been doing all this work in games and I got approached by an organization in New York, um, turbulence.org, uh, offered me a commission, a small commission. And they said, you know, could you come up with a proposal? And I was like, okay, I've been doing all this stuff in computer games for so long, maybe it's time I make a computer game. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I wanted to do a game around drone, drone warfare. But the thing about drone warfare is how do you turn that into a playable experience? Um, if you're the drone pilot, you have total agency. If you're a civilian on the ground, you have no agency at all, right? And so I, I worked, this is what brought me to Scotland for the first time. I worked with a team of game designers in Dundee, Scotland, and we came up with this game, Killbox, which is a two-person player. Um, you can download this for free on Steam and other places, um, but you ideally would play this against another player. You can do it as a single player as well. Um, but we had two points of view. You were either the drone pilot looking down on a map that was actually based on an actual drone strike in uh, North Waziristan where a grandmother was blown up in the fields in front of her uh, grandchildren. Um, or you can play as this little sort of idealized child um, sphere on the ground. And we would set it up in installation formats. This is the most raw way you might set it up with two computers across from each other. And you go through this process of a drone strike. And if you're on the ground, you get killed. If you're the drone pilot, you're launching a drone. And the most formal way we set it up was like this with the kiosk. And at the end of the game, you look up and you realize that that guy just killed me. And then the game restarts and the roles switch. The person who's the drone pilot becomes the civilian and vice versa. Um, it's a very simple game. Um, it really, I think, is quite effective in kind of showing what this might be like from either point of view. Um, we've had people come away from this experience very disturbed, uh, some people crying, um, and it's kind of meant to do that. It's not meant to be fun, um, but it, it, it achieves something. Uh, I'm not always sure, entirely sure what, but it at least gives a kind of sense of what this might be like. Um, some other projects dealing with drones. This is a series called Thrift Drones. Um, I love thrift stores and secondhand shops, and um, I just started buying strange, vernacular, discarded artworks from these spaces and cutting and pasting drones into these secondhand images. And it just, I, it just creates, again, this like sort of bringing these home, like putting them into our context, making them visible um, on these things that people don't want to look at anymore, right? And they give them away to secondhand shops. And I've done, I did done about 150 of these here in the United States, did about 160 in the UK when I moved over there. Um, the idea was, to basically then eventually take all of these um, and re-donate them to thrift stores so that they repopulate and go back out into the world. Um, that got stalled by the pandemic, right? It plans to kind of start doing that in 2021. Um, so actually there's what's happening. This is all of the US ones shown at a exhibition at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art in 2017. Um, but these are slated to be distributed to thrift stores in Las Vegas near Creech Air Force Base in the next month or so. Uh, the crew from the uh, museum, uh, Southern Utah Museum of Art that is going to be taking this on for me, which is great. Um, but more on this later, but 
anyway, it, it is about sort of putting these back and also like making these things that are really kind of precious and interesting and then giving them away and sharing them. Um, perhaps the uh, darkest project I've ever engaged in is this one. And I made this was the first piece I did after moving to Scotland. And it was in response to the uh, shooting at the high school in Florida, which Donald Trump partially blamed on gun violence and video games. Um, this is the Gun Violence Archive, and um, it notes uh, from, let's see if I can see the numbers here. You see a homicide murder unintentionally of 15,000 people killed in 2019. I started looking at these numbers and realized, wow, okay, 44,500 something American troops were killed in Iraq over 10 years. That's one year, right, in, in America. Um, that's what's going to seem kind of shocking to me. Uh, I wanted to make a piece that kind of spoke to gun violence and also computer game violence. Um, what I did was I worked with a game coder, the same coder who worked on the drone project, the drone game, and uh, we hacked into Grand Theft Auto. The Grand Theft Auto has a connection to Dundee, Scotland, where I was now living. Grand Theft Auto was actually created in Dundee, Scotland by Scottish game designers, most of whom never visited the United States. They based the game on their experience of American gangster movies. Um, but I, I took this game, and what we did was we, we changed it so that it would scrape the data from the Gun Violence Archive, which was updated daily, uh, depending on the killings in the United States. And if you see on the bottom there, it says 3,760 on 7-12, 2018. So July 4th, 2018, we launched the project. And what the game would do is it would go say, it would see from the Gun Violence Archive, July, mid-year, about 7,000 people had been killed by guns in the United States. The game would then go the, that day and play through all 7,000 of those deaths in simulated form with avatars killing each other and taking the, 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 the head count there. And then at midnight, it would reboot based on the previous day's numbers added to that 7,000, now it's probably 7,100 or something, and then it would play through those that day and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not sure this video has great audio, but let's see. Yeah, sorry, this is the one with the bad audio. Um, I need to fix this. I used the uh, original recording of God Bless America that was recorded in 1938, as I recall. accelerated re reenactment every day. Um, by December 31st of the year, it was just insane. It was like up to like 15,000. It was just total mayhem. At midnight, it was silence. It was really, like you got to midnight and realized no one's been killed yet. And then several hours later, boom, the first avatar was killed. Um, apologies for the video. Yeah, so that, that was a really intense project. Uh, got about 250,000 views on, on Twitch. Sorry, I forgot to mention it was live streamed on Twitch uh, for the entire two years of its operation, or one year of its operation. Um, some other projects, uh, this is from the mid 90s. I'm jumping back a bit. But these are a series of virtual paintings, and these were um, oil paintings, large scale, about six feet tall of first generation VR depicted through traditional oil paints. I, I'd been trained as an illustrator, as I met before, met, mentioned before, so I didn't know how to paint, uh, although I'm colorblind, so I was really not very capable with the kind of color aspect, and I would always have to, have to ask for help, and it was a bit irritating. Um, but I made several of these, and they were, they were interesting, but I, I kind of, I think I did about five or six of these. I just love that sense of that bizarre nature of us putting the box on our heads. You know, I think we grew up with a mother who told us not to sit so close to the TV. 
um, here we are, like, you know, completely immersing ourselves. Um, but you might notice I'm wearing these tinted lenses. These are in chroma color correcting glasses. And I got these just after moving to Scotland. And it's just this revelation. I could see color, I could paint, I could, you know, and, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe I need to get back to this. So I had gone to this very strange festival in New York City called the Future of Storytelling. We showed a kill box there. And, um, there were dozens of virtual reality experiences and but it was one of those rare October days in New York where it was just sweltering hot as it is here today, which is of course you know bizarre um, and scary. So all of these experiences were really hot and people were sweating into the goggles and it was just gross and I just I really didn't want to so I just started photographing. I started photographing the people in the spaces. And this is a couple doing a game VR experience based on your John Lennon and Yoko Ono in bed in Toronto, right? Um, this one, I can't remember what the VR is, but again, it's like, and, and almost all of them, particularly standing ones, you had this weird minder who was there to make sure you didn't walk into the walls and hurt yourself, right? And it's just, I, I just find these so intriguing. Our, you know, our relationship with technology, with each other. Um, this was one based on, I think, climbing a tree in, the, in, in Oregon or something. Um, this is the kind of photograph I would take. So this is a photograph of a VR experience at this festival with people attending a music festival in England together. Um, this is the resulting painting. And um, this one was a, uh, I think it was called Blind Date. So they're, they're your, like you're on a blind date with this person next to you who you don't know. Um, this was later taken in Dundee. This is actually my daughter, Sarah, uh, in a VR experience. Um, this is from a, a technology museum in, um, in China, in uh, Chengdu. Um, um, this is, a, that's actually my wife in a VR uh, exhibition in London. So I've done about 20 something of these. I have loads more of them to do. And it's just something I'm going to continue to do. There's something fascinating about how we engage with these devices. And it's a moment in time, right? We won't be wearing these things 10 years from now, right? Um, I just find, find it fascinating, our willingness to engage with this kind of stuff. Um, this was my response to the NFT craze. Um, some of you may know John Baldessari's very famous piece where I will not make Dozens and dozens of times. Anyway, I did that. Enough said. Um, I've recently, however, returned to the, my artist mails. And, um, I had a, 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 this big exhibition that came up in Oklahoma, but the largest mouse drawings I had were with me in Scotland, and they were framed, and they were framed in such a way I couldn't really get them apart for easy shipping in a tube. So. Uh, I said, uh, I'll just remake some, I'll just send. So I started playing again uh, and some games and you know, just doing all my work and made some, I just got back into it and it was, it was interesting. Um, and I realized I kind of had stopped doing it before really kind of fully exploring the possibilities. Uh, I adapted one actually for play on a PC and doing brushwork. And I'd done some brushwork before, but partially with my new glasses, I, I as well wanted to engage in some color and some play. Um, this is actually just a, this is a study uh, based on playing with uh, Cezanne and it's based on a, a photograph of one of his pieces I took in London and just kind of exploring possibilities. These are small, about this big. And I've gone into working on a much larger scale and I started a series where I'm engaging in, with painters, abstract, expressionists, surrealists, etc. But it's just paintings that I really adore and artists that I, I really am, am fans of. Um, this is work by Sai Twombly, who a lot of people saw my mouse drawings and they were like, oh, it's like Sai Twombly. And it's like, yeah, of course it is. I love his work. So I, I, I did a piece that was um, essentially, this is it in action, it's called um, Playing PUBG with Sai Twombly. And uh, PUBG is uh, public, oh gosh, what is it? Public battleground or something. Um, it's a huge, hugely popular shooter game. Uh, you all land on an island in the last one. 
their wins or you're playing teams, etc. But I would, and, and, and concurrent with this, I forgot to mention, I dislocated my thumb in February and had to have surgery. I couldn't type, I couldn't make anything. All I could really do was play games. So I, I actually spent about, probably about two weeks solid playing PUBG and making this painting. Um, and set up a system where I could do this. Um, and this is the result. This is about a 12 foot wide canvas. And, and if you can see about the, you know, I would write down the number of kills that I would get in a match. I wasn't very good at the game, so that, and that this, my score was always pretty bad, but that really wasn't the point of it. Um, the slide doesn't really show the, the nuance of this very well. I don't have great documentation of this one yet. Um, this is the uh, second one I did, which was uh, playing Fortnite with Lee Krasner, uh, based on uh, one of her paintings I saw at MoMA in New York last February. And again, it has notation of my scoring. Um, this gives an idea of the scale. Um, and this is a work in progress where I'm playing Red Dead Redemption with uh, Hilma Hofgold. And based on the painting there on the card, um, and just really kind of having fun with this, but it, it, there's a critical part to it as well, right? Um, there is something meditative and very, you very much lose yourself in this kind of activity. Um, but then to be making something creative at the same time, you're engaged in these, these odd experiences of play. Uh, I find that really kind of intriguing. And I'm just going with it right now. I'm, I'm just making these and then seeing where they go. Um, I've gotten back into some further mouse sculptures as well. Uh, this is based on uh, Van Ray's piece called The Gift, which in French I'm forgetting the word now. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, and it's exactly the same number of tacks that are, are there on the iron that he made. Um, this is the most recent one, just finished a few weeks ago. And this is called uh, La Malediction, which is the curse. Um, it's a, a PlayStation uh, controller that has been converted into something rather unplayable. It has something to do with injuring my hand, for sure. Um, finally, just a project that is in progress. Last slide here. Um, starting in November 2019, I was I, I just started collecting all the single-use, non-recyclable plastic that came into my life. Um, it's in, in England and in Scotland, all of your fruit, veggies, everything comes in plastic, and there's so much packaging. And I know there's loads of packaging here as well, and it, it just goes in the trash, right? So I started saving it, and then after about a month, you know, I had probably, you know, big tra you know, trash bag full. I just kept doing it, and then the pandemic hit, and of course, everything was being delivered and there was more packaging there. So I landed up after a year of this with about eight large um, contractor-sized trash bags full of non-recyclable plastic. And what I'm doing is basically been cutting it into loops and strips and I'm braiding it and I bought myself, I was trying to think of what to do with this. You know, I talked to some grad students today, it's like you do these things with objects and materials, and what do you do? And it, it took ages to figure out what I want to do. I mean, I collected all of this uh, four years ago. And I finally had the idea, I'm wearing there a, um, a Harris Tweed suit that I bought on eBay. Um, they don't match, but it's, it's all right. Harris Tweed is a classic Scottish tweed suit and the, the idea behind Harris tweed was like you would buy one suit and it would last you a lifetime because it's so well made and it's so sustainable and it's amazing right and I thought that has a substrate for what I'm doing but what I plan to do is basically sewing these braids and bits of plastic to the herringbone pattern right so that I would then have this it's kind of like a ghillie suit like a camouflage suit is to wear this and do some walking performances um, in Scotland and you know walking to the recycling facility walking to the just go do typical things and you know to talk to people about you know this is my year this is a year's worth of my plastic me and my plastic right so that's in progress but anyway that's me 
um, you know, a little bit over an hour, so that's all right. But uh, we do have some time for questions, and, uh, and there's a special treat, so you don't want to wait until we're done with the questions. I promise me you'll be intrigued. Um, but thank you very much. some other single performances before that one as an individual performer in the game space. But I was thinking about, like, there's you always have these clans and people who play together and all this kind of stuff. There's a whole subculture out there of that type of thing happening. So I thought, why not? Why not? What, what if you thought of, well, I should, I should mention one of the basic parts of the of Howl and Quake was looking at those game spaces as a new type of public space. Like, like these are enclosed environments, like this theater, that imply a whole world out there, but you can really only play in this finite amount of the space. But I thought of it, that's, that's, like, that's like this new commons, like it's this new, and if I buy this game, why do I have to only do what you say I have to do in this? So, but, but yeah, it just, <clears throat> somehow it was one of those weird matchups that just seemed to make, fun, make, make, make sense. Um, so I just kind of went with it. But it was another one of those things, like, I'm generally most interested in work that I'm really not sure about. Like, it really makes me nervous. And that was one of those things that was like, is this just dumb or is this really interesting? I don't know. You know, it's like, and sometimes you just have to go with that and see where it lands up, where, where it goes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I tend to go towards those things that are challenging and make me feel a little bit like, you know, like bringing Casualties into the America's Army game. It's another one like, oh, that, that project scared me to death, but I had to do it. You know, it's like really important. Yep. Hi, thank you for your talk. Sure. Um, Spaces and it's like you know, you know hi, hi. You know, it's like it's just like what do you do? Like what? And, and I think that's a, that's such a good question. Um, it's something that I think I'd probably bring forward in my uh, in the teaching that I do, and, and I'm 
master's program at Aberdeen uh, University, where like like last term, teach teaches class where we, we break the students into design groups, and it's quite different than anything in the teaching I've done over here. And we give them these design challenges. Last last year we had a fascinating you know, outside stakeholder come. St. Andrews, a woman who was teaching a class in peace studies, and she said, I want to work with some of your students and make a game about peace, right? And, and I was like, oh, that's perfect, right? And brought it to the students. But it was, it was like, it was so difficult for them to really kind of do that. And they, they kind of failed uh, majestically. <laughs> and it was, I think, and, but we talked about that. Like the game, game mechanics are, you know, the easy ones are violence, and, uh, you know, competition, and you know, all these kind of things, and how, how do you bring, you know, like, how do you make a computer game about Buddhism, or, or you, know, you know, there are meditation games, there are some really successful ones, but it is, those are, those are really challenging things, and I think that's the kind of, but, but then you like look at something like, uh, like Journey, I think is very successful in that regard, you know, that it does, and, but that was, that was a game they set out to do, not to be a shooter, and to be nonviolent, but also engaging and you know, totally involving. Um, that question, do I think shooter games are bad? Um, I, I don't know, I, I kind of go back and forth on that. I think they're, I think they're a bit too easy, but um, there, there, there's some scant evidence out there. I think there was one study from Rutgers University that noted that when major game titles were released, actually actual real world violence went down just a touch, like as people were at home doing it pretend, I guess. I don't know, I, I kind of, I mean the thing, the thing when, when like Trump comes after games related to sh you know shootings and that, and there's a lot of, there's always talk about that, but there's been very little correl correlative evidence that that these violent games actually lead to real world violence. You know, so it's, it is, I don't know. I, I, that, that's, a, that's a very good question, but I think the, um, the larger question is there's so much more that I think could be done with these games and with the metaverse and all that kind of stuff. But, they, but there's, it's so easy to fall back on these tropes. And also, maybe I was talking with Aaron today about how frustrated he is when so many students just want to come in and do anime figures and all that kind of stuff. We have the same problem. It's like, you know, students oftentimes so much want to do what they know and what they've played so much is these games that have the same kind of mechanics in them. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there that's that's happening as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know. See, but very good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Well, well, like with, I think Dead in Iraq probably has a real, you know, that's such a direct correlation to what I was trying to do. You know, it was about that game. Um, much of the other projects, it tends to be something that I've, I've either come across or I'm interested in or I've played a little bit and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I, this wouldn't bore me playing this for 20, 25 hours, you know, that type of thing. Um, if, if, if I'm not interested in the game, it, it just doesn't. It's just like anybody else, I just don't want to play it. So I have to find things that actually seem, you know, kind of intriguing. And like PUBG was uh, something I started playing during the pandemic and when you couldn't go out, you couldn't go outside, right? And, and, and I, I just loved, probably my favorite part with that was the, the intro bit when you were waiting for the game to start. It was at least like two minutes long when there were, the characters were just running around. And I would just sprint towards the ocean go swimming, you know, and it was like, oh my god, I'm outside, you know, it was like, da, da, da. And so that, you know, and, and I, I, I was like, okay, maybe I'll make a project with this, you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing, so 
Uh, Red Dead Redemption was one that I started, I first engaged that just after moving to Scotland, and I had lived in the Sierra Nevadas, the Sierra Nevada and Reno for 20 something years. And the first time I went into that space in Red Dead Redemption, I, I it sort of brought a tear to my eye. I was like homesick. It was like really like, they really captured the American West in a visual, really, it's, it's like, it's like beer stock quality environments and you're wandering around and I had some ideas for something, but I just, it, it's, um, yeah, so that, that, and I, I didn't do, you know, so I'm working with that right now with the, the painting I'm doing. Um, yeah, it's like, it, in some ways it's like, it allows me to do these games, to play them so I can keep up with what my students are doing and what games are, what things, what things are happening while at the same time making something interesting. It is a game usually that I'm interested in that, that I'll engage for sure. Any other questions? Uh, and far back there. Uh, I'm curious about, you mentioned the uh, procedures that you use when you have the, 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 the pencil or brush attached to the mouse. Mm -hmm. You know, to create uh, uh, a work while you're playing the game. But can you tell me how it works? How it works? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, it's basically, it's my, Natural mouse movement working on the computer or playing the game. So there's no, it's, it's almost like blind drawing. If you've ever done that in drawing classes where you're told to look at something and draw. I'm just, I'm doing my everyday computer activities. So it's, it's just my mouse movements translating through the brush. Like with the pencil, but with the brush, it looked like you weren't actually putting the mouse over the paint. So there's sometimes that that would happen, but I, I'm mostly moving. I'm mostly moving the canvas bit by bit. Okay. That's the, the mouse station is almost always the same. If, if I'm not careful, the, the, the mouse gets, I even have to wash the mouse sometimes, but it's usually, and I'm working with acrylic, which dries fast enough that it's, you know, that I couldn't do oils. I tried, it's just too messy and it doesn't dry. So it is this like I, I'm moving. The same thing I did with the paper. That's why I did so many circles. It is a it is a kind of knowing that way. With the 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 Hummel one, um, it's a bit different. It's, it's I've been trying to fill these circles and kind of doing some shapes and things with that, which I've never done before. But, um, I've also done some with some very big brushes, and those are mostly sort of ink on paper. I didn't show those to you, but they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, good, very good question. Uh, there's a question here. So that idea came about in uh, 2004. Um, you know, the, that was when the um, the World Trade Center site memorial proposals were published online. Uh, the Manhattan Development Corporation did this international call for anyone to submit proposals for the 9/11 memorial, and they got like 5,000 entries. There's a website you can go to, and you can go by country, by theme, and you can see all these things. And I remember they did that, and I was like, wow, oh, that's pretty cool that this is a very transparent process, you know, that anyone could submit. But also, that I, I remember thinking at the time, it's, it's, it was a year into the invasion of Iraq, um, and many, you know, many thousands of civilians had died, soldiers were dying in ever greater numbers, the insurgency was starting. And I thought to myself, boy, there'll never be a memorial to the civilians who are dying in Iraq, right? We always remember our own. We forget about you know those those victims that are killed by us. And I started thinking, oh, what's going to be the next Vietnam veterans memorial? You know, because I grew up in the, it, it, I came of age as an artist in the '80s when the Vietnam veterans memorial controversy. Um, uh, my own is very amazing. Memorial happened, and that's always stuck with me. And I started, so I was thinking, like, I was going to be the memorial to the soldiers who were dying. 
somehow that was like, and I had been thinking about America's Army and it just sort of, oh, you know, and that, so that was kind of that point where that, that idea came from. Um, but I sat on it for, I sat on that idea for a couple of years because it really frightened me. And it was, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's okay. thank you for the question. There was a question, yeah. I think it makes sense if you get criticism from the right in any age you can find it like Do you ever get criticism from the left that is saying that the gamification of these issues is trivializing real life events or that it's um, that there's a humor that's kind of implicit that uh, that isn't sensitive to uh, the events of the No. Yeah, not really. Um, I'd, I'd have to say n no. Um, when, when I did when I was going to Iraq, like I was getting mostly really negative emails, and I kind of said, I only got one email from an actual soldier who was serving in Iraq, and then I got emails from like mothers of soldiers who had died, and I was really like, wow, thank you for doing this. Um, the most challenging message I got was an email from a guy whose brother had died in the war and killed. And he sent me a very respectful email. He said, you know, I respect your right to do this, but my brother uh, believed in his mission and what he was doing. He was killed. Um, would you please not include his name in your, in your project? And I was, I was just like, and I, I think that was part of what I really feared with that. Where it was hurting, adding to the hurt of those who had lost the war. Um, but it really, it, his message really pushed me to engage that and, and engage him. And I, I wrote back to him a very long email and basically said, and I really, really respect where you're coming from. And in fact, I, I looked back and I had already included his brother's name. I did, I did it chronologically. And I said his name has already been done. Um, you know, I don't mean to cause you any hurt, but my one of my concerns about the way we treated Casualties, the American casualties in that war was that it was a, as soon as they died, it was up to the families to worry about. It. Like if we didn't see the coffins, you know, they, they wouldn't let us see the flag draped coffins coming in and all that. And, and I, when I told them, it's like I actually saw a, uh, I think it was about 2000, 2004, 2003. There was a there was a sign in a window in Reno. There's, I mean, remember there was all uh, support our troops and all of that bumper stickers and everything. And there were the funny so when I did the handwritten thing, I said, remember our troops. Like they were being forgotten. And it was like, yeah, it was sort of fading from so it was part, you know, I said this was my way. As I said, I, 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 what I told him was like I could not accept that it was only up to him as a family member to mourn his brother who had died on our behalf. Like we funded, we were responsible for him being there. And as a citizen, this is my way of paying respect and, and, and questioning as well. And um, he and I were eventually interviewed together on a show on NPR, which was really quite an interesting experience because we had a really respectful conversation and voiced our different kind of points of view of it. And the, um, what was astounding to me was even with NPR, they edited it down to conflict. So when you actually heard it, it was like, I was like, what did they do? Like this is not this is not the conversation they, that we had, which was that was quite something to experience. When was it? That would have been two thousand six or two thousand seven. Um, there's a transcript of the talk that I think I have somewhere, but that I can't find the recording anymore. Any other questions? Yes.
can't speak to that except that the, the piece, it actually opened up, um, there was another project that I did, sorry, that, that I didn't mention, but in reaction to that 9-11 memorial, that was a, it created an online call for anyone to propose imagined memorials to the civilian casualties in Iraq. It was called Iraqi Memorial.org. It's not online anymore. We got about 250 proposals to that, and several of them came from veterans who were kind of turned to art as a way of expressing themselves. Um, and, if, and through that project and Dead in Iraq, I have met and been connected with several veterans groups, but mostly they're oriented towards uh, kind of anti-war activities and continue to be. And I've met some really extraordinary people. Um, I've not, like I said, I heard from one soldier, one active soldier during the, that project. Um, curiously, what I, what I did hear from mostly in terms of people who were really upset by what I was doing by people who weren't involved in the fight they were kind of, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't veterans, it wasn't PDF, it was like, you know, kind of armchair warriors, I guess you would call them, who were, you know, not in the fight. And I, I and I, I did hear from, actually, by way of, some of the, some of America's Army was developed through a big game studio thing at USC, which I'm forgetting the name of. Um, a friend of mine was a, a professor there. Actually, talked to two of the game developers who worked on America's Army, and they found out about my project, and they they really appreciated what I was doing, which was really kind of like, oh, okay, that's good to know. And and, and I would imagine, I don't know, I, 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 I can't imagine what you would feel like having gone through that war and killed people, watch your friends get killed, get named, or whatever. We now know that you know. I mean, we knew then we were intelligent that it was a it was a ruse coming in there. Um, so that had nothing to do with 9/11. Um, there were no weapons of mass destruction, all that stuff, right? And yeah, millions of civilians killed. Da -da -da. It's just you know, I, I I don't know what you would feel like at this point. I think but you see it in the fentanyl crisis. You see it in the you know, I, I, you know, but I, I I don't know. I can't speak to what how this. Works. That's a really good question. I'm not sure how to how to actually measure that. But thank you very much. Any last questions? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I should close it up. Yeah, yeah. Have something. I've never done this before, but uh, I was just in Reno clearing out art storage, and one of the things I discovered was uh, most of the work had come back from that exhibition in Utah. The folks who have the thrift drones are going to be taking them to Las Vegas, um, but they sent a box of them home, um, and I've been kind of distributing these a bit. Well, I have three of them here, and